Thank you, Gareth. Uh, we will next hear from Christopher Simpson. He's a professor of journalism here at American University, but known internationally for his expertise in propaganda, democracy, and media theory and practice. He has won national awards for investigative reporting, historical writing, and literature. His books include Blowback and The Splendid Blonde Beast and many others. Welcome, Christopher Simpson. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here, especially on this panel with Sam and, and Gareth. Um, and I, I want to give a special shout out to the previous panel. It's because I was very impressed with the work that they had done on the connection between patriarchy and war, patriarchy and power structures. Very important stuff. OK. Well, Sam was talking about really the sort of day-to-day -day struggle of getting peace news, or at least um, contrary news or opposition news, into mainstream media. And Gareth was talking about a broader picture of, first of all, the importance of media as an arena of struggle and ways to address that that uh, make some strategic uh, sense. I'm going to look at something different, and that has to do with why is it that Here's Stephen Biko. I'm sure you've, you've heard of him or you know of him. The mo he said, this is in the context of the, of the South African struggle, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it that people will accept or at least tolerate oppression and even internalize it? So that's what I'm going to talk about, or at least try to. Uh, let's see. All right. Here's the four main ideas. Propaganda is pervasive, and it's shaped. Second, prop information operations at home and abroad are integral to media operations these days. It's not a sideshow. OK, next, mass media remains an important arena for struggle, which uh, you know, Gareth and, and Sam and I have known each other for a while, but we, we didn't consult on these, these presentations, and yet it seems to have become a, a part of all three of them. I put my address here. It's because I'm not going to read these slides, uh, because that would be hopelessly boring. Um, but if you would like copies of them, send an email to me with your email on it, and I will send you a copy of the, of the PowerPoints. Okay. There's a paradox in the United States, in our culture, and it's it, our origin stories lay claim to democracy, freedom, freedom of speech, justice under law, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, the actual history of the country has been frequently quite different. Um, the main points here, I'm sure you're aware of. Um, I would add to Gareth's points that one of the things that we're experiencing right now is a deep crisis of legitimacy for ruling elites in the United States. This is on both sides of the, of the mainstream aisle. Uh, we're also experiencing a deepening economic crisis, which has as its results the, what is called the hollowing out of the middle class and working class. Uh, and uh, we appear to be, in terms of technological um, um, events, the, um, facing an enormous loss of jobs for people in this country and in other parts of the world as well. But there are some upsides to this, and that is the victories that people in our country have uh, won over the years to protect human rights, civil rights, their own rights, independence, and freedom of thought. So I'm not going to read this, but I would like to point out something that we haven't really discussed very much so far today, and that is the role of educational systems in reinforcing the main propaganda or ideological lines, if you will. Um, of today's myths, and one of those is that you have masters and servants in society, 
And if you want to be a master, you have to go to college. And that having completed that, that you will at least have a shot at reaching that status. And there's several messages uh, uh, embedded in that. One is, is that the masters have virtue, that they are masters as a result of their virtue or their brains or their hard work, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also, it, it suggests that, the, that there's a great deal of social mobility in the United States. And it is true that there is some social mobility in the United States. It is less social mobility than almost any other industrial country in the world. And it has gotten much more difficult to rise in the social ladder during the past 15 years. All right. During the 1990s, or yeah, 1990s, there was a professionalization of public relations, marketing, and propaganda. It became much more sophisticated than previously, a larger economic force, and uh, routinized. It became an ordinary part of what um, corporations, politicians, even low-level politicians, use to pursue their goals. And as, as some of you will remember the Ging Gingrich campaign strategy for Republicans. This is the conception that you accuse your political opponents of being evil. And this is what underpins much of the Republican Party strategy up to the present day. Clinton's, uh, uh, Bill Clinton in that particular case, uh, articulated some new democratic strategies. <laughs> All right, one last thing I want to point out here is propaganda and surveillance became integrated. And I don't mean ethnically. I mean that they are two sides of a single coin. And that typically had been more separated previously into different specialist groups. Now, when a candidate, a company, an advocate of one sort or another pursues or develops a strategic communication policy, surveillance of its audience the ones they're trying to reach is tightly entwined with the propaganda strategy itself, the content. And you see it in the, in the presidential elections. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about information operations, which is simply Pentagon talk for propaganda operations. It's viewed as a force multiplier. And as such, it has become a profit center, if you will, for public relations community and so on. Um, the, and we, we know quite a bit about how these information operations work. It's because there's been leaks, there's been declassified information and so forth. Another thing that we know about it is that because we're in a more globalized media environment, that means that messages that were uh, intended, let us say, for the Afghan public will also reach the American public and vice versa. And what that means in turn is two things. One is that we have more data about the on-the-ground situation in conflict zones than has previously been possible. And the second thing that that means is that there's a bureaucratic struggle within the government over whose turf it's going to be. Is it going to be the State Department's version of what we're doing in Afghanistan? Or is it going to be the Defense Department version of what we're doing in Afghanistan? And they're not the same. Is it going to be USAID's version of what we're doing in Afghanistan? They're not the same. And in fact, they rather often conflict with each other. This is um, Department of Defense strategic communication planning uh, in about 2007. And um, it's, a, it's a declassified uh, graphic here. Let me stand over here. This is an early version. <laughs> and you, you can see that it's a Department of Defense working hard. Uh, and, but what they, 
in, in fairness, what they have done is to try to break down the whole of culture and the whole of communication patterns and to chart it out in such a way that they can enter into it and make use of it to pursue their goals. And this, in, in this particular case, is basically uh, discussing Iraq and Afghanistan, but they've tried to do a generic setup of you have your host government, you have the infrastructure in that country, you have opinion leaders in the country and so forth, then you have the, the coalition's capacities and its priorities, the extent of domestic support for the coalition, and so forth and so on. So they've tried, not entirely successfully, but nevertheless, this is the, this is the goal that they were seeking in putting together communication strategy for their, for their operation. <coughs> this continues it. Here you see a basic, uh, it's really quite a simple uh, structure that, that says, well, we've got different types of audiences, we've got different types of resources, so here is how we're going to try to put it together in a systematic sense. All right? Here you see it more elaborate. And here what you have, again, is what you see more clearly here is that they, con they, they conceptualize this as uh, different types of activities and the dimensions in which those activities are carried out. Physical is Department of Defense speak for military, for war, for guns, for physical action sometimes called kinetic. Those of you who follow this stuff will be familiar with that. Um, and, and this one is a more concise thing. But what is interesting about this one in particular is that you see, if you look under physical domain that is on the uh, right-hand side of this uh, presentation, that striking, maneuvering, protecting, which are traditional military roles, are viewed as integrated with the information operations. So here's the, the uh, Department of Defense doctrine for 2014. It's not classified. I'd be happy to send you a copy of it. But the, the point is, is that by, you know, kind of the the curiosity of history in the United States in our time is that we have good information about the thinking of the people who are making decisions about these types of operations. So now we turn to coping with mass media. I agree with much of what, what uh, Sam said. You have to cope with mass media. Mass media is not our friend. <laughs> Never has been. Not really. There's, there's been passages where people have done good things, there's good reporters, so forth and so on. But as an institution, it has never been friendly to uh, the peace movement or, or any other movement. So that puts us into a funny spot. It's, and this is a philosophical question. Is the way, and this, this goes to, to Garris, uh, uh, proposal. That is, do we attempt to transcend propaganda, to move beyond it, to move more deeply, to move somehow more truthfully? Or do we engage in propaganda in order to reach the same audiences that the mainstream media reaches? And uh, it's a complex question. There's a lot of different layers to it. But here's some ideas. Watch the frames on stories. Framing is a communication technique in, in which corporations do it uh, very well. There's a particular story, there's a particular crisis, the company has particular interests there. They will define their public message in such a way that it is framed so that what they have to say is 
uh, the focus point, the focal point, right? And the stuff that is problematic for them is not touched. It is left out. Now, theoretically, reporters should have the job of knowing what's outside of the frame and bringing that into the story. But as a practical matter, that is frequently not the case. And we can discuss the reasons for that. But as activists, as peace activists, what you do is you watch these media frames to see what has been left out. You identify the frame and you surface it. You bring it to public attention. And I, fr I think, frankly, that, that that is a big part of what, what, uh, uh, what Sam has done and done it very well. OK. Uh, you identify the unspoken assumptions of media narratives. Now, one of the things, how much time do I have, please? You're good. <laughs> OK. All right. You have uh, four minutes. OK. All right. That'll work. Um, Content of media is or are narratives. They are little stories. So you can think of them as fables or as parables. They have little plots that, in which good guys prevail over bad guys or bad guys prevail over good guys. You have, you have identified interest groups in the little stories. And you, if you talk to reporters, you'll know that sometimes a reporter will say, oh, that, wrote, that story wrote itself, <laughs> right? Why? It's because it followed a narrative that was quite simple to reproduce. <coughs> All right. So what you do is you understand that reality about mainstream media, and media generally, and you surface it, you bring it to public attention to show, as, as Sam was talking about, that the assumption of NPR concerning the Spanish events was actually, uh, it wrote itself in the mind of that reporter. If, do, do you see what I'm saying there? Okay. Um, and finally, here's, here's something really basic when it comes to television, the cursed medium, um, and that is pictures, pictures. If you don't have pictures, you will not be on television. You can start with that assumption. Uh, so that if you, if you want to uh, access uh, that audience or that medium, you have to deal with what it views as its professional standards. All right, this is basically a, uh, uh, a wrap up. Um, what I would say here, and this also goes to, to um, uh, Garris' proposal, is that humor satire, daringness, those help to crack the media bubble. Not automatically, but those are powerful tools in coping with mass media. So use it. <laughs> um, all right, and then and the last thing is, is I think that part of the campaign to be active in the media arena has to be a, a direct and powerful critique of the arena itself, of the assumptions and of the techniques that media organizations bring to trying to explain the world to their audiences. Uh, that's all for now.